Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Indra Naik. I'm a software application architect at IBM. And um, I'll be covering this presentation, Serverless Computing, Is It the Right Architecture for You? Uh, I'm covering for my colleague, Daniel Crook, who is, whose picture you see on the bottom right-hand corner. He's the uh, person that was um, intended to do this presentation, but he had a family emergency. So um, I'm standing in for Dan. Um, so hopefully I'll do justice to some of the work that Dan put together. Uh, we've got um, a fairly intimate audience, so we can keep it interactive if you have any questions during the presentation. Uh, there are a few things that I want to do as we go through this presentation. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the state of uh, cloud computing, um, the options that we have. Uh, we'll cover a little bit of introduction into serverless computing. And then in order to decide whether or not the architecture is something we would want to use, we'll compare cloud uh, serverless architecture against two other container services, uh, Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes. And then we'll talk a little bit more about um, architectural considerations when we make this choice. In order to help us, we'll just use a sample application that you know, we've taken the output from as we deploy that application through those three scenarios. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please just raise your hands. We have um, a decent size audience given <laughs> the time of the day. So thank you all for coming, and uh, I hope it's going to be useful for you. So when we look at the, uh, the uh, landscape of uh, you know, the cloud native landscape, there's lots of options uh, for native cloud applications, and this is the uh, See in uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation landscape of all the options that you have for different parts of your cloud computing network. And every day there's a new option coming up. And sometimes it's not always um, recommended to choose just the latest because it is the latest. It might not always be the best choice. So as you look through your choices, there's always new ones coming up. And um, you, know, you can have a look at some of what's available here. But one thing that we've seen in cloud computing is that containerization is a given for cloud applications. For several reasons. You know, one of it is that it enables greater density. Uh, we can run many more containers than we can virtual machines. It's got faster startup. It's, got, it's consistent. We create a container. We know what it's going to behave like. And when we deploy it, you know, we know that its behavior is very predictable. Additionally, what we're starting to see is that cloud infrastructure is starting to enforce cloud best practices. So as you use some of this infrastructure, it actually uh, implicitly forces your application developers to be able to stand by best practices such as those that uh, have been pushed by um, Heroku or they've been documented by Heroku, the 12-factor cloud uh, application. So in terms of life cycle and variables and uh, dependencies, these, this cloud, the cloud infrastructure is starting to make sure developers actually follow certain guidelines. The other great benefit of cloud computing and of a container-based infrastructure is that it, em it enables polyglot microservices architecture. You can write your application in whatever, or parts of your application in whatever language you prefer or that best suits that particular function, and then use that runtime for that particular function without affecting your entire application. So these benefits that containerization gives us you know, means that it's definitely going to be part, I mean, it is the way our cloud applications are going to be structured. Now I'm going to break away a little bit and just talk about serverless. How many, in, how many of you in the room have used serverless computing? So it's just a few hands up in the room. So we'll just get into um, some of the basics of, cloud, of serverless computing. If we look at the, uh, the, um, the history of where we've come from in terms of monolithic applications, when we had applications that were running within our fixed infrastructure, they were usually all self-contained. So all of the functionality within the application was contained within a single uh, container, within a single environment. What happened with cloud computing is 
it lends itself to breaking itself up into microservices because when you write a cloud-based application, you have the opportunity to leverage many more services that are not within your infrastructure that might come from a third party. And so it actually forced, not forced, but unintentionally, people started using those services and we end up breaking down into a microservices architecture. We use services from all over the place, so we break up our own applications into microservices, which is, a, which is good. But the, um, the ability to manage microservices as they grow is a challenge because, you know, firstly, we want to make sure that these microservices are scalable. Um, then as we scale those microservices, we want to protect them against regional outages. So, you know, we group them together and we make sure that we have duplicates on, within various geographies and to make sure that these microservices, if they do go down, we've got backups to be able to do those microservices. But this is microservices as compared to monolithic applications, right? How do microservices, and the relationship between serverless computing and microservices is um, not direct. There's no direct relationship between the two. Serverless computing provides an infrastructure for microservices to run on, but not every microservice can be run on a serverless computing infrastructure. But we can get into more of that later. But when we look at the types of workloads that we generate that are coming out now, these event, you know, they lend themselves to uh, event-driven programming. What we see happening is that um, you, you've got these particularly non-HTTP workloads that are event-driven, and we just want those atomic workloads to be able to run. So some examples of those are, you know, when we execute some logic in a database, um, in response to some, you know, something being added to a database and we want to make sure that you know, we run a function, so, sort of like a um, shared procedure as a service. Or we're getting analytics from sensor data in IoT and we're streaming that sensor data and at some point we want some action to happen because a particular sensor gave us a, a particular um, a value and only at that point do we want an activity to run. So we don't want you know, an application cycling all the time. We want an application only to be able to run when it comes across a particular value. You know, other instances that we've seen, um, you know, cognitive computing via chatbots. When you're trying to write a chatbot and, you know, you don't need to have everything running all the time. Instead, when you get a particular response, you can kick it off and run, run a particular function. Um, other ones are, you know, typical workloads like when we are running a backup, scheduled backups, they only happen during certain parts of the day, and we don't need to have a function or a, an application running all the time. So all of these new workloads, you know, they lend themselves to a type of computing where we don't want to pay all the time for something to be up and running. So what's happening now is that you know, with cloud computing, it was always an economic consideration. So the new cost models that we have, they more accurately represent our workloads. What we want to do is to pay only when we run. So what happens is that you have a certain workload, it's gonna run for about five minutes during the day. You don't want to have a server idling for all day. You have that, that particular function only run during that five minutes that that server, that, that load actually presents itself. Now those loads could be predictable or unpredictable. Sometimes they will be there or sometimes they might not be there and you don't know when they're going to be there. So, you know, we have this idea of serverless computing. Now, the infrastructure, as we mentioned, serverless computing is a piece of infrastructure that enables you to provision the infrastructure when you need it just for that particular function. And the way, um, We've done it in IBM, is on the IBM cloud we use, uh, you know, we, we uh, started this project OpenWhisk, which we uh, now, which is now run by the Apache Foundation, and this platform provides that ability to do the serverless deployments. So it only runs code on demand and on a request basis, and that means that we don't have to have infrastructure up and running all the time to, um, service code that would only be running for part of the day. So, you know, we talked about all of those container-based value adds like the polyglot programming model and all of those. This is a piece of infrastructure that enables that. So, how does it work?
Now, the, um, just um, for your information, that URL in the bottom will describe to you how to install OpenWhisk on OpenStack. But the way um, this uh, project is built, it makes use of a number of um, other Apache projects. And if you start from the top, what you see on the top is that every request that comes in to run a particular function you know, provides a RESTful interface. So that request comes in through the Nginx and, uh, HTTP engine, and it comes in through the controller. That controller is really the heart of the serverless environment. What it will do then is that the controller goes to get some uh, authentication and authorization from uh, the CouchDB database to determine whether or not we've got permission to be able to run this function. Um, if it knows that we've got permission to be able to run the function, it'll go and get the function from the database. Uh, it'll then check with the console engine where, what other, what execution environments are available to be able to run the function. And then it'll put that function onto the Kafka queue to be able to, um, uh, in, uh, so that that queue can manage that function uh, and then it can be invoked by the invoker. That invoker is really a Docker container containing uh, that piece of code that needs to be run. And the output from that is stored back up into the CouchDB database. And of course, the output is sent back to the requester that originally requested it. Um, anyone have any questions up to now? Sorry, say that again. Uh, how it actually invokes the function? Um, the question was, well, you know, will we have any details on actually how that invo invocation happens within? Um, within the OpenWhisk environment. And uh, no, we've, I, I'll point you to some details at the end of the presentation. But really, the point we want to get to in this presentation is you know, architecturally, what is the right choice? Do we choose serverless over another computer environment, or is serverless a good choice? And or when is it a good choice? So we want to get into more of the architecture, uh, the architectural discussion on serverless. Okay, so uh, I'll just hold that question and let's see if we can get to an answer as we explore the options. Okay. So the reason I don't want to answer the question up front is because we, we, we want to get to an answer, understand when is it a good environment and compare it against other existing environments. So if you look at it from a developer's perspective, the way the developer sees things is that um, the developer will define the actions. The actions is the actual code that's going to run that you see on the bottom right-hand corner of this picture, right? When does this code run? It'll, the developer will also define a set of triggers that will decide what would trigger this code, and there are rules that map the triggers to the actions. That will say when this trigger happens, this action happens. Now, you can also um, have an action call another action. So you can have them uh, chained, a set of chained actions. Okay, so from a developer's perspective, what he's doing is writing a piece of code, which is just an action, let's say just hello world. He's creating a trigger that says, this is when it's going to, you know, if this happens, then run this piece of code, and there's a rule that'll tie the two together. So you can have a number of actions, a number of triggers, and tie all of the triggers to actions. One action can be triggered by uh, one trigger can trigger multiple actions. One action can be triggered, uh, an action can be triggered by multiple triggers. So you can share actions, so to speak. You know, you write an action once, it can be used many times. Now we also have a number of packages 
those packages will contain a set of actions. So let's say, for example, we have a cognitive packet on, package on Watson where there's a set of actions to convert text to speech or speech to text. Okay, so all of that is contained within. And when a developer sees this, it's very simple. So just a, this is a sponsored session. So this is uh, our commercial break. This is the IBM Cloud, and this is where we implement the, uh, the tooling for OpenWhisk. And you know, you'll see not only do we offer the ability to develop the functions, we have a full command line and GUI to, for you to be able to do it. And you've got tooling to be able to monitor the functions, how long they're taking, how many of them have executed successfully, how many haven't. So it's a very fully functional OpenWhisk interface in uh, the IBM Cloud platform. And the commercial break's not gonna stop there, so you'll see intermittently, we'll go back and forth, but ideally, everything we say about um, uh, serverless functionality is very similar to whatever you're gonna see in AWS Lambda or in Microsoft Functions. Yeah. So, when you're choosing a containerization approach, which one is right for you? You know, which one is gonna work best for you? When you're building an application, what do you choose? Do you choose Kubernetes? Do you choose uh, Cloud Foundry? Do you choose uh, serverless? Do you choose a combination of the two? Uh, this is really the intent of this presentation, is like, you know, really which one do we choose and how do we know when we've picked the right one or will we ever know that we've picked the right one? So, what we wanted to do was just compare three typical scenarios uh, that you might choose to run your serverless applications, uh, sorry, to run your cloud-based applications and compare the three, right? The first one is, let's say, we want to do Kubernetes. And we want, Kubernetes, of course, allows us full control over the infrastructure. We define all our containers, we put them into a cluster, we have containers as a service, and we run our applications within those containers. Our second option is go with Cloud Foundry, where we focus on the application and the data, and the application, uh, the Cloud Foundry um, infrastructure provides us the platform. It, ha it manages, it builds its containers, um, or its runtimes and build packs to be able to allow us to do whatever we need to do and run the code within that um, container. And then the third option is where we do functions as a service, where we define a set of functions with Apache OpenWhisk or the IBM Cloud functions, and everything is driven through those cloud functions. And we'll just talk about a comparison between the three. It's highly likely for most fully-fledged applications or for most uh, applications you'll choose a combination of the two, but we want to try to understand architecturally which one is a better choice when it comes to these three. So, before I move on, any questions to this point? Uh, how do you choose the libraries? Like, assume like I have some Java or HTML that I'm uploading for spinning up, right? Based on what you will define your backend, like uh, how you will choose your RSA or some other way to code for, how you choose my GB, do you just ask the user or the test code to take it? So, the question was, how do I choose the libraries of uh, prerequisites that I might need for my code? And that's a good question, right? Because here, what we're seeing is that um, if you look at the Kubernetes versus Cloud Foundry versus OpenWhisk, um, on the um, x-axis, you have less control over the stack implementation. When you do Kubernetes, you're defining the container, you're deciding exactly what's gonna sit in the container and how it's gonna connect to whatever it's gonna connect to, right? So you have full control. And, and typically what we see is people who have been working with virtual machines, this is really a natural place for them to go, to start with. They like the control, right? All the database connections, everything you defined within your container sits here. The next level up with Cloud Foundry, you're really leaving it up to the platform. You have some control because you can specify which build pack you want to use, and you can also define some of the services you are going to connect to, and, all, and, and, and you, you have a greater degree of control. The least degree of control you have is with OpenWhisk, where you're just defining a function that's going to run. And OpenWhisk is really intended for, this, this serverless architecture is intended for really short running, five minutes or less, 
you know, that uh, this function only has to run within that period of time. So when you um, have a lesser degree of control, um, some of the things that you want to specify, you cannot. You cannot go and tell OpenWhisk which version of uh, JavaScript or uh, Node.js you want to use. It's just going to use the one. It's leaving it up to the provider to decide which one it's going to use. Okay. So about yes. So from a developer's perspective, when you look at Kubernetes, they have full control over the environment. They can decide on what's in the container, how the container is structured. But when you get up to OpenWorks, they don't have any control. They're focusing really on just the business logic in the application. So if you start off with Kubernetes, you know, if most of you might be familiar with Kubernetes. It's, um, you know, it's a build and deploy all your applications. You've got, the fun the, you've got full control, but you own it. You have to manage it. You know, it supports all the secure bindings. You can also scan your containers to make sure there's no uh, issues. As I mentioned earlier, the target audience here is really around developers who are used to um, full control of the environment. They usually come from a virtual machine background or from an enter enterprise background where they had complete control and this is the one they want to use. They would like to, they, they start off using. The way we would do it on uh, the IBM cloud service is that, you know, we'd use the, uh, the Bluemix command to be able to define the Docker images uh, in our private registry and then we'll deploy a Kubernetes cluster and then we would bind all of those uh, containers to the, um, to the uh, 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 bind all the s services to any of the, uh, the, the cluster that we need, and then we can monitor the cluster as we continue. With Cloud Foundry, uh, we're focusing on the application, and it's really platform as a service. Um, it's, we, do not have, we, you know, we do not have to worry about deploying or setting up the environment. We create the application, and we just, deploy the application on the, on the platform as a service environment. So the buildplex and um, you know, all the service bindings are managed by the platform. Uh, here we're focusing on developers. You know, usually they, they start off, it's focused on HTTP type applications, which um, it's made for and not for a more traditional application, more you know, non-HTTP or uh, other enterprise type applications. And this is for organizations that have been more comfortable with, um, you know, just born on the cloud type applications. They really don't want to manage infrastructure. And here, you know, what we would do in order to be able to do this on the IBM cloud is we'll just use the Cloud Foundry or the Bluemix command line to be able to define the application. We can use the GUI and we can decide which build packs and which services we want to run and we bind those services to those build packs and then be able to deploy the applications and then we can monitor those applications as we move on. The third option that we have is what we've been talking about now is the functions as a service. Here we have a platform that's gonna run a really short-lived container instance and um, in this environment here we have no infrastructure that we have to care about. All we do is we define the function, we define the triggers, we define the rules and when we invoke the function, it is up to the environment to be able, it's up to the provider to set up the container that it's gonna run in, bring up the container, let it run, and then bring it down. So when we do this on the IBM Cloud, we have a, on a WISC command that allows you to create the functions, define the rules, define the triggers, link the two together, and then be able to monitor all of the invocations. Now, if we just take a simple application and we were gonna do this with open with the three environments that we have, um, the, there's a sample application that we've got here. What it does is compute Fibonacci uh, numbers uh, up to a number of iterations. And um, what we can do with this application is simulate a crash and then decide what happens. So what we're gonna do is just talk you through, what I'm gonna do is just talk you through how we would deploy this application in uh, these three environments and then run it and you know, look at what are the responsibilities we have when something happens to this application. Um, before I move on again, any questions? Sorry? Uh, 
uh, the trigger has to be defined in the, in the IBM cloud or wherever you're running your function. But you would call, you would use a RESTful call to call that function. And that RESTful call will uh, initiate the trigger, which would call the action. Yes, that restful call would be outside the cloud. Uh, one more question. Like, uh, does this function have a void time? Like, if you let the key for the first time, should I have a function that will get the first time? Sorry, say that again? Uh, does the function execution have a void time? Like, something like AWS Lambda has to let the key for five minutes or something like that? Yes, five minutes. Okay. I think that's the limit on Lambda as well. Okay. So if we were deploying this application on Kubernetes, and you can run through this, these, some of these um, steps on your own. You know, after this presentation, you know, we would clone the sample code of GitHub. And then we'll build um, and push the, the the code to the container on, a, on an IBM private registry. Uh, we create the Kubernetes cluster on uh, the IBM cloud service, and then we'll deploy the set of containers to the cluster. So those are the steps that we would take to be able to do these. Um, we can then run tests against those and simulate a crash for any of these, uh, of, of these functions. Now, if we were doing this on Cloud Foundry, we would do the same thing. We would clone uh, the sample code. And then what we would do is we would go in and update the configuration file with our, um, with our host name that we're using for our application. And then we would push that application up into the cloud, and then we would run the test against the host name. In the third case, you know, for OpenWhisk, again, we would clone the, the repository, and then we would um, update the OpenWhisk functions. We have a convenience script that's in there that'll push this function up to OpenWhisk and define it as an action, and then we would test against the host name. So if we've got these three functions up and running on these three platforms, then what we see is what the, the output that you typically would see is this. Now, this application that's on GitHub has a monitoring function which you can use, and this is what you'd usually see. In the case of OpenWhisk, sometimes it takes a little longer to get started because the container still has to be created. And but once it's started on the bottom, you'll see that OpenWhisk continues. Um, it's built for scalability. So when you do simulate a crash, it comes back up really quickly. Uh, on the top with Kubernetes, it also recovers really quickly. You, you know, when you simulate a crash, it'll reinstantiate and then come back up. Uh, with Cloud Foundry, because it's got a global resource manager, it, you know, it takes usually a while for us to be able to recover with uh, Cloud Foundry. Now, the reason we did this was just really to show you that we had to, we had those three platforms. We had OpenWhisk, we had Cloud Foundry, and we had Kubernetes. So if we want Kubernetes and Cloud Foundry to work better, we really have to own the problem. So what we would do is we'd add more instances by scaling the services. So we can add more um, uh, containers to our Kubernetes cluster, or we can add more um, uh, more instances of our Cloud Foundry application. And you know, once we would confirm that these new instances are live, uh, we can go ahead and try to be able to uh, run those functions again, and it would look similar to what you see here. But the big difference between the three platforms is really that you do own the responsibility with Cloud Foundry and with Kubernetes. Question? So I think that's a key question to the differences between the three models. When you do OpenWhisk, you're automatically building for auto-scaling. Because um, OpenWhisk is, when you define, or any of these functions as a service, when you define a function, you're saying, you know, the platform decides how to scale. You don't specify, I'm going to scale this way. It's built that way because every time a new function is called, it'll create the container, it'll execute the function, and it'll continue doing that no matter how many you send through, right? You can set maximums, but you cannot. Um, you can set a maximum number of invocations per period of time, but you cannot, you don't have to set the minimum. The, the system is gonna take care of it. 
Okay. But for the other two platforms, you have to use some auto-scaling architecture underneath it. Right? For Kubernetes or for Cloud Foundry, you have to choose uh, some function that's going to auto-scale the architecture. So how do you choose which deployment option is you were talking about? So if you look at the three options that we looked at to decide whether or not OpenWhisk really is an option, when we look at Kubernetes, you do have control as a developer. You um, decide the runtime environment, you know the versions, you know the operating system, you've got great reusability and portability because um, you manage everything. You decide what goes into those containers. Now you, of course, with all of that, you have the responsibility over that package configuration and you need to understand and manage that whole distributed system. With Cloud Foundry, on the other hand, there is no need for you to manage the underlying operating system. You use the system build packs uh, and it's really focused on HTTP applications because that's how, you know, that's the reason it was built. Um, so you don't have control over the operating systems, but you do have control over uh, the build packs for, you know, for the most part. With Apache um, OpenWhisk, on the other hand, everything is abstracted away from you. You don't have control over everything. The platform that you choose to run this function as a service will decide how it runs and what it uses. You cannot decide that for this particular piece of function, I'm, I need this version. So the charging model is based on execution time per gigabyte hour, and it's really, really low. I can, I'll show you the, the spec sheet. It's, it's the execution time per gigabyte hour. So the, and, and I think the, 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 um, the reality is many people would start um, deciding whether or not they use OpenWhisk because of cost, right? One of the reasons we're going with one of the three models is OpenWhisk only, you only get charged when it runs. For the other two models, you might have a Kubernetes cluster up and it's up and running and you're paying for it while it's live. With the Cloud Foundry application, it's up and running and you're paying for it while it's live. With OpenWhisk, you're not paying for it unless it's running. It only runs when that trigger is invoked. Okay, so technically, cost is one of the big advantages of OpenWhisk. But when you consider the choice of the three platforms, cost, it's not always about cost because there are other considerations that you're going to have to make. And we list some of these on this chart. The first one is you're going to have to evaluate the features. You're going to have to test and decide what works best for your application. And in all likelihood, you'll probably use a combination of the two, uh, a combination of more than one of these services. You're going to decide how much control do you need to exert over your environment? How much do you need? Uh, with OpenWhisk, you're completely at the mercy of the uh, service provider. You're going to, the best way to do this is to, of course, test it and decide, you know, how do you secure environment? How do you manage all of the services that you, that you are putting out there in order to be able to get it to run? And the other um, question about latency is that your services, when it comes to OpenWhisk, is going to run in the, same contain, in the same environment as everyone else's. So you have, in a public cloud, that whole environment is going to be shared. So let's say you know, everyone decides to run their services all at the same time. You know, you're obviously at the mercy of the provider. So when you consider running this over more than one platform, um, you know, consider, about, uh, consider firstly you know, which components make sense at which point. Um, some of the functions that you abstract out for might be you know, suitable for OpenWhisk while you know, a majority of the application might be running on a Kubernetes cluster or on uh, your, on your Cloud Foundry application. Serverless is not going to be the answer to everything, but it is a new tool in your toolbox for you to be able to use. 
You can also make, um, design your application so that it's fairly independent of uh, the choice. All three are container-based. You know, all three um, architectures that we just talked about use containers, so you can easily move from one option to another. You, with all of the three options, you can use any of the DevOps pipelines because you've got you know, full command line interface tools, so you know, you're not um, hindered by any of these options when it comes to uh, being able to manage your code base. And as we move forward, there's going to be a lot more information on serverless. It's very new, and you, know, you would consider using some new serverless frameworks that are becoming available today. So just in summary, I think the key uh, to this is that serverless is a great new feature for native cloud applications. You know, it offers us an opportunity to be able to do things in a way that might not have been possible a few years ago. It's um, built in scalability and the way it uh, we are, the, the way we write code actually forces us into a very scalable architecture. When we consider using um, serverless, it's, we have to consider the cost versus the performance versus the functionality and the control that we want to have over the applications. We've got some more, uh, links here if you want to know more about serverless computing. Um, there's a number of projects that um, the, this application that we talked about, the multiple deployment option, is on um, that GitHub repository. We also have a more in-depth application, the Flight Assist application, that you can again have a look at. That'll show you some of the, you know, some of the more detailed functions that you can call within those three options. And there's a number of new functions. If you need some hands-on assistance with using it within an IBM Bluemix or an open WISC environment within an IBM within the IBM cloud, you can always reach out to the developer advocate team, which I'm a part of, and Dan as well. So that's the end of the formal presentation. Um, we can have some discussion or any questions. Yeah, we have, um, let me just bring up the, the dashboard and show you what we've got. I think I can drag this over. So this is the IBM Cloud uh, OpenWhisk developer interface. So you can create a, um, you can create a, you can create the function here and then you can run the function and you know, input parameters, you can also create sequences for functions. So in this case here, you can have one action call another action and you can test it within this environment. You can create rules and triggers and then be able to, to test those all within this environment, this GUI. Any other questions? Does it support debugging on the... Uh, no, it doesn't. This interface doesn't. You would probably write your code in a traditional IDE and then debug it there. You, you're just going to get... There's no debugging, no step through debugging on this panel within this tool. For just that one function. Yeah, just one function of it for the reasons. Okay. And uh, I, I want to better do any cleaning some of the, uh, the services I have. So when that REST call is made, it'll, it'll send through some authorization with it. And when we define these functions within the, the, um, 
OpenWSC environment, we can specify which functions are allowed by, you know, what, who is allowed to run which functions. So that's the extent that the security model goes through. Any other questions? Okay, thank you then. Thank you for coming and uh, 